Could we finally be seeing some accountability and contrition from Dr. Anthony Fauci? The first day of Fauci's marathon questioning session in front of the Congressional Select Subcommittee on the coronavirus pandemic is any indication? Probably not. During a seven-hour closed-door session, GOP lawmakers say that they grilled the good doctor on his previous testimony, asserting the NIH does not fund gain-of-function research. Fauci defended those statements and testified that he signed off on foreign and domestic NIAID grants without the reviewing the proposals and was unable to confirm if NIAID has any mechanisms to conduct oversight of foreign laboratories that it funds. Mm. On top of that, new reporting indicates that the scientists at the center of the lab leak met with NIH officials during, including Dr. Fauci, in June of 2017. Reporter Emily Kopp writes that Wuhan Institute of Virology senior scientist Xi Zheng Li passed a security screening to visit NIH staffers in June of 2017, where she gave a presentation about novel coronaviruses. EcoHealth Alliance arranged the meeting. President Peter Daszak was also present. Here now to discuss her bombshell report and what Fauci knew, according to newly uncovered emails, is reporter with Right to Know, Emily Kopp. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So what do we think was actually asked and answered in this closed door session? And my main area of interest now is whether Fauci had to um, answer questions about um, information uncovered, I, I believe, by you, that, in fact, in, in grant proposals, the fact that the research was going to be done in Wuhan was disguised from approval boards. Um, and there were, you know, some notes there from EcoHealth Alliance-affiliated people saying that, you know, we don't, it'll, it'll trigger too many red flags if we say we're going to do the research in Wuhan. But once we get the grants approved, we can do just that. Did Dr. Fauci, do you think, have anything to say about that? Well, so as you mentioned, this was a two-day closed-door marathon transcribed interview. Fauci did agree to testify before the full committee publicly later this year. Um, and I, I certainly hope they ask about my reporting on that. But it's clear from the um, statements we have from the committee so far that he was grilled on what oversight mechanisms NIH has regarding um, the foreign labs that its grantees work with um, and that those regulations are very much lacking. Um, a few other sort of takeaways from the notes that we have from the committee is that Fauci said that the lab leak theory is not a conspiracy theory, which contrasts with many of his other public statements and many of the statements of the virologists who worked with Fauci early in the pandemic to downplay the possibility of a lab leak. Um, and and so, so that's quite interesting. He also said, I don't recall a hundred times. Of course, it follows him saying, I don't recall um, nearly 200 times in a, another sworn testimony um, in 2022 before attorneys general. Um, so, you know, we'll have to wait for the transcript um, for more details, uh, but um, look forward to that. Um, yeah, Robbie, as you mentioned, I reported last week or the week before that um, regarding a grant proposal proposed by EcoHealth Alliance, this intermediary between NIH and the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, submitted a grant proposal to the Pentagon saying that um, it intended to do research in the United States under a relatively rigorous biosafety level at a BSL-3, um, but notes I obtained on earlier drafts uh, showed that this was um, a lie meant to mislead the U.S. government into thinking that the research would be more safe than it really was. And they, in fact, intended to do it in Wuhan at a lower biosafety level in which respirator masks are not required and ventilation conditions are not as rigorous, essentially in order to save on costs. But they wanted to make the grant makers more comfortable, quote unquote, so they um, misled them in their grant application. And this is important because this particular grant proposal, many scientists say, lays out a blueprint for creating COVID-19 in the lab. It uh, calls for the collection of SARS-related coronaviruses and the insertion of fear and cleavage sites at the S1, S2 juncture in the spike protein. And of course, now, you know, we've all experienced a pandemic of a SARS-related coronavirus with a fear and cleavage site at the S1, S2 juncture. So that's highly relevant information for the origins. And I'm sorry, was Fauci asked about that 
that document, that that reporting, because it's one thing to answer. I do, I, I do not recall to uh, questions about which there isn't a, a, do a documentary record of him having been involved with those decisions. But this seems like something that documents reveal prove that there was this intent to hide the risk level that was associated with these Chinese labs that were likely to be where this research took place. I wish I could say definitively. Unfortunately, all we have is um, statements from the committee. We don't have the transcribed interview yet. My understanding is that they'll use the the um, transcribed interviews behind closed doors and the public hearing later this year to put together a report for the public. Um, so, so I hope so. I, it definitely seems like they asked about um, just the complete lack of adequate regulations when it comes to gain-of-function research, as well as um, whether or not he perjured himself when he testified to Senator Rand Paul in 2021 that the U.S. did not fund gain-of-function research in Wuhan. Of course, now that has, as you mentioned, Bree, been proven unambiguously true um, that the, or, or false, sorry, um, that the that um, the U.S. did indeed fund gain of function research in Wuhan, and um, Fauci's testimony was was false. Um, so that's another thing that I kind of I'm looking forward to seeing in the transcript and in the public hearing how he will justify that false testimony um, and how his legal team plans on helping him avoid a, a perjury conviction. What else can you fill us in on regarding Xi Jinping's visit? to the United States, um, how that was cleared, and how, if at all, that should inform our knowledge of, of the plan to do the research in Wuhan and whether it was going to be safe? Yeah, so I think um, the timeline here is really important. So we reported that um, Fauci and the uh, staff at his institute met with Peter Dadzik, the head of EcoHealth Alliance, and Xi Jing Li, senior scientist at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, in June 2017 and October 2017. And by December 2017, a few months later, the NIAID, Fauci's institute, decided to, um, to or was very influential in helping to get rid of the pause on gain-of-function research, just to sort of um, research to enhance the danger of viruses that the EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology was doing. Um, so, so I think that timing is key. Um, you know, Dazik is known as sort of being a very charismatic person, um, as well as she. And so, whether they influence that decision, I think is um, is something that we should consider and maybe ask Fauci about. Um, and I think. It's also an open question how Xi Jinping managed to pass a, sec a security clearing to visit, um, you know, a U.S. agency because we know from declassified intelligence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was working with the P PLA, the Chinese military, since at least 2017. So that sort of raises yet more questions about the lack of regulation when it comes to this very high risk virology and the biosecurity risks associated with it. Um, why was that not a red flag for, um, for the NIAID back in 2017? Hmm. Sounds like there can be some really uh, fruitful testimony coming out of this and the hearing that's coming later this year. Thank you so much for staying on top of it, Emily. Thanks, guys.